fault of my own. I'm running short on time, so we have to go. We have to go, go, go. I am so glad you're all here. Thanks so much for coming. How are you? That's not really. <laughs> How are you? What an amazing show, right? Every year, this thing gets better and better. So I'm all glad. I'm glad you're all here. I appreciate you being here. Uh, let's get underway. We have very little time and lots to cover. First of all, I should mention up front that the spring team is hiring. Uh, we at Pivotal are hiring. So uh, you know, if you if you feel so inclined, if you want to work with the best, uh, then well, maybe go somewhere else. But if you want to work with the with the rest of us. Uh, we're, we're pretty awesome. We're not bad. It's not the worst thing you could ever do. Uh, we'd love to have you. Uh, and uh, there's that. We have a lot of openings. I'm not sure what, what projects right now have openings at, at any given time. I tend to, you know, tend to forget these things, so don't worry about that. A uh, little bit about myself. Uh, of course, uh, first of all, we're going to go through a lot of stuff today. We're going to go through a lot of stuff because the goal is to see what's possible, not so much to, to uh, focus on any one particular uh, thing. So with that in mind, I encourage you to grab this this, uh, uh, this slide, take a screenshot perhaps, uh, for your own reference, for your own edification uh, for later on. There you'll find all sorts of interesting stuff about the code and so on. And if you have questions, if you have comments, feedback, whatever, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm very happy to help. I'm here for you. You know, I want to answer questions. I want to be able to introduce whatever you want uh, with respect to all this stuff we're going to talk about today. So don't hesitate to reach out. How many of you are, uh, how many of you are on Twitter? I'm just curious. Twitter. Twitter. All right, very good, very, very good. That's it. very promising. What about email? What about email? Is anybody here using email? No, good, moving on, moving, moving on, moving on. A little bit about myself. My name is Josh Long. I'm a Spring Developer Advocate on the Spring team. I'm an open source engineer and contributor. Every Wednesday, I do these, um, uh, these videos, these, uh, these Spring Tips videos. They're on a uh, YouTube channel, and that link there, that bit bit.ly forward slash spring hyphen tips hyphen hyphen playlist is a, a YouTube playlist where you can find all these different spring tips. They're just me at a keyboard exploring, exploring some corner of the spring ecosystem, whether it's a, you know, some very obscure thing like, you know, retry uh, operators or, or, or tr distributed transactions or different types of dashboards or, or whatever. And there's just all sorts of good content there um, that I hope you'll uh, explore. I'm also, as I say, a Java champion and an open source contributor and engineer. I work on a lot of different projects. I have the dubious distinction of being the number one, number one, top ranked, most prolific, most vil you know, visible, most highly acclaimed, uh, most widely known contributor of um uh, of bugs but still number 1 number 1 <laughs> number 1 number 1 number 1 across all the different projects to which I've been a contributor uh in my decade plus contributing to these various projects so there so there's that uh and I'm also a uh, I do instruction videos I do these videos that you can get on um on Safari, these are all you can eat, all you can eat style, uh, subscri subscri uh, Netflix style subscriptions to technical content. It's Safari. How many of you have ever used Safari, the online marketplace, technical marketplace? Okay, there you go. So uh, you can buy these a la carte, but don't do that. Just get the, in, you know, get the all, all you can eat subscription and then, and then use that. Uh, and then you can watch all the videos and then, you know, whatever. Cancel the account if you want. Uh, so there's that. Uh, and uh, of course, I, I have just finished, finally just finished. And by the, by, the, by the way, the last time I was here, this wasn't done. So I'm very happy to be able to finally talk about this book, which is now in the past as opposed to the, the imminent future, which it was for, for a long time. We were looking to get this book done. We thought we would be able to get this book done so very quickly. We thought, given our esteemed uh, sort of privileged position within the community, given what we thought, what we knew about the technologies, we thought, my co-author, my co that is to say, my co-author Kenny Bastani and I, we thought that this book, would be a very easy, very quick uh, uh, um, uh, thing to get done. Within six months, we'd have no problems getting this produced and published. But it did. Hi. <laughs> we thought that uh, within six months, we'd be able to get this done, no problems at all, right? We thought it'd be very quick. Uh, but it did take, in point of fact, it did take a little longer than we had expected it might uh, take. It, it took, it did take just a little longer, all right? It, it took a little longer than we'd expected it to take, okay? And we thought, again, what with software estimates being a solved science, right? We thought that, you know, six months, we could predict it to the date, six months from the future, we'd be able to say it would be done right then and there. Uh, but, uh, you know, who are we? What do we know? It, it, it did take a little, it took a little longer, okay? It did take a little longer to get the book. And I'm, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that it's O'Reilly's fault. I mean, who would say that? That's ridiculous, you know? I mean, why would you even think that? That's silly. But, but it did take a little longer 
to get this. And again, it wasn't O'Reilly's fault, really. But, uh, but again, it, there, was, there was a long period of time extra that, it, that, that, require, that was required to get this, get this book done. Again, you know, there was a, I, I can understand why O'Reilly would have trouble uh, and why we would have trouble. It, there, was a, there was some intense discussions, okay? I'll just go ahead and say it. I feel like we're friends. I can be honest with you here. We, I don't want to air my dirty laundry. But nonetheless, nonetheless, it did take, it did take just a, okay, it took two years, all right? It took two years. It took two years to get this book uh, done. It did take, as I say, just a little, a little bit longer to get this book done. And again, there's good reasons, you know? There's always good reasons behind this kind of thing. So for us, uh, a lot of that ended up uh, a function of the deliberation, the debates, the discussions that we had, uh, uh, the, the author team and I, you know, my, my author team and, uh, and, and the publisher, the, dis the rancorous, cantankerous, arduous, sometimes tedious discussions that we had uh, in those extra 18 months, those extra 18 months we, we spent deliberating the animal on the cover. Now, anybody who knows anything about O'Reilly books knows that it doesn't all that much matter what's in the book proper. Nobody cares. It's, it's everything to do with the animal on the cover. And we eventually, after, as I say, 18 or so months, uh, we eventually arrived uh, at a, 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 I think, really wholly appropriate animal. This is a blue-eared kingfisher. It's a bird with blue ears. Did you know birds have ears? It's a bird with blue ears from the Indonesian Java Islands next door, basically. So it's a bird with, with blue ears from the Indonesian Java Islands. And this bird is it's indigenous to the Java Islands, or as we'd say in English, it's native to the Java Islands. And it's a bird. And birds fly, yes, through the clouds. <laughs> it's a bird. And birds fly, yes, through the clouds. So it's a cloud-native Java bird. It's a bird that, it's a bird that flies. Never mind, it'll come. So anyway, we got that bird, uh, and, and then we decided to you know, ship it, publish. You know? uh, and, then, and then we did, and it was fine. And so it's out now, and you know, I hope you'll like it. Uh, and of course, I work at Pivotal. And at Pivotal, we have a lot of great open source software. We love open source software. Uh, we care very much about the open source software. It's, it, it permeates everything we do, and yet it is not the main reason we're here. It's not the thing that drives us. It's not the thing that most motivates us. Uh, what we care about, first and foremost, is helping people build better software uh, faster. And we want to see people go through that cycle as quickly and capably as possible. But we know that people struggle with this. They know that they need to go faster, but they don't know how. They look at the existing ecosystem and they look for ways to go faster, but they struggle with how. And uh, a big part of the, uh, the recognition from this insight, from this uh, sort, of, sort of surveil of the landscape, is that uh, if you move to a microservices architecture, then you get to the situation where you have smaller teams. The smaller the team, the more readily uh, you can change software. The smaller the team, the more easier it is to reason about the impact of a given change into that software. The smaller the team, the faster uh, you're able to iterate. And this is not... Uh, a particularly new or controversial insight, right? There's been a lot of uh, uh, sort of evidence to this uh, for a long time. Mel Conway in the 1970s seized upon the insight that software is a mirror image of the communication patterns of the organizations that build it. Put it another way, if your software, if your organization is dysfunctional, that'll be reflected in the software that that organization builds. And so we move to these small teams and we need a, a logical way to take our existing large, unbroken, monolithic code bases and to decompose them into smaller team-size team oriented uh, chunks of functionality. So we look to, look to Eric Evans. Eric Evans has a great book called Domain Driven Design. And in this book, he talks about this idea of a bounded context. If you can identify a bounded context, you have a natural place along which to decompose your microservice into smaller batches. And when you move to this architecture, when you move to this architecture of small, singly focused, uh, independently deployable, reusable bounded contexts, microservices, you get a lot of uh, benefits, chief of which, of course, is organizational agility. There are some secondary benefits, technical benefits, uh, but there are also some problems that you're going to confront when you move to this architecture, some pains that you have to confront. And when you move to this architecture, you, you have to get past, first of all, the, 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 the use case of standing up a single production-worthy service. How quickly can you stand up a single production-worthy service and operationalize it and get, into, get it into production? If that takes a long time to do it, then you won't do it. That's the first thing you have to get past. And then the second thing that you have to confront when you move to this architecture is 
How, what about building a distributed system? When you move to this architecture, you have hopefully a proliferation of small, singly focused services deployed over the network. This invites the complexity of building a distributed system into your life. And if you're ill prepared to address that complexity, you're not going to enjoy the journey. And one, one thing that people start to see, uh, especially after they've moved to this architecture, as they start to move to a world where we have more and more data being conducted over the wire, over the network, they start to appreciate that the traditional approach to moving data around, the traditional approach, especially on, the, on, on platforms like the JVM, doesn't really scale. We see this uh, as we start to move more data about from one node to another over the network. We start to see that the traditional approach where you have a server socket, a server socket is listening there, it's sitting there waiting for incoming requests. As the requests arrive, it spins off your code, the program, the web server, spins off a new thread. That new thread is charged with producing a response. So think about Tomcat, for example. Tomcat sits there, it has a server socket, a client comes in, client hits the server socket, server socket says, okay, I'm going to accept that incoming request, and then the, the web server spins off a thread, and then that thread wakes up the servlet stack, the servlet stack wakes up the Spring MVC dispatcher servlet, and then Spring MVC wakes up your controller, or REST controller, and it wakes up your particular controller method. All of that happens inside that thread. And as long as the time it takes for a request to arrive and for the uh, controller to be w waken up and then to have the response sent back to the client, as, as long as that time uh, for the whole cycle to complete is less than the time it takes for a new request to arrive at the server, then everything is fine, right? So think about this. Threads are very expensive on the, on the operating system. They're a very expensive resource. You don't want to create more than you know, a, a fixed number of threads in your operating system. They're very expensive. So normally you have a, a thread pool. And this thread pool reuses existing threads. So if you've got 100 requests hitting your web server, and, you've got another, and then another request comes along, that thread, that, that new request is going to be starved. It's not going to be able to, nobody's going to be able to process it. The way you fix this is by making sure that you can quickly reuse exi exi existing threads. How quickly can you re free up that existing thread? If the time it takes to, to produce that response and send it back to the client and then free up that thread is longer than the time it takes for another request to arrive, you're in trouble. And this is a problem not necessarily when you have a monolithic application. With a monolithic application, everything is running in the same node. Everything is uh, being done in the same node. So this cost is not really, you don't see this as much because you don't have so many APIs, right? It's just human beings clicking around web pages that drives this kind of traffic. But as soon, as soon as you start moving to APIs, where you have more and more things being done over the network, over the wire, then you start to see that there's a saturation point here. So the problem with this, the, the, the limitation that we're describing here, uh, is fundamentally not necessary. It's a bit unfortunate. We have, uh, for the last 30 years, have had a way to do better. The operating system has had a way for us to do better. This is a... Uh, this is the biggest shame about the situation we've arrived in. We have requests coming in, and we are limiting our ability to produce responses to the number of threads that we have in the web server, when most of the time, the reason that these responses takes uh, a long t period of time is because of input and output. If this is the case for you, if you're doing something that is long-lived and you're producing and you're moving a lot of data across the wire, uh, you know, from a database or from some other web service or whatever, when you're doing network I/O or database I/O or, or any of these other things, if the reason that your request is taking so long to process is because of this I/O, then there is no reason for this to be a limiting factor, a, a throttling point for your server. So the question is, how do we un how do we break this link? How do we decouple the production of replies from the number of threads in the web server? Well, we use asynchronous I.O., which, you know, sounds obvious, but think about how that works. Imagine that you had the ability to say, okay, here's some I.O. I want the operating system to hold on to this file descriptor or to this, you know, thing that has memory on it, and I'm reading data from it. When there is new data from that file descriptor or from that thing, I want the operating system to tell me when that is happening, when, there, when, the, when there's a, something I need to pay attention to. The operating system can do this. It has been able to do this for a long time. At the lowest levels of the operating system, if you write code, if you write network code using the lowest level C APIs or Objective-C APIs in your operating system, that is fundamentally an asynchronous operation. You don't sit there waiting for the next byte. Instead, the, the operating system will tell you there's another byte available. And in the meantime, you can do other things with your threads. That's, that's been there forever. And yet, we don't think about that when we write our code traditionally. When, we're, when we write code using the JVM today, it's very common for us to think about things in terms of input streams and output streams. 
this gives us the illusion that data uh, is always going to be there. We can just keep on reading the data as quickly as we want. But this is a limiting problem when we run into a situation where we have a lot of data. So we move to this new approach. We have this new approach where we're publishing data, where, where, where something is publishing data to us. That's a much more reasonable approach to this. And in the meantime, while we're waiting for that data to come back from that file descriptor, we can reuse our existing threads to do other work. So we're not sitting there blocking, waiting for data. This new approach where we're having data pushed to us, as opposed to pulled, uh, is what we want to get to. That's how we solve this problem. It's how we free up those threads to do other work in the meantime. The problem is that the code above the lowest levels of the operating system doesn't know about that, right? If you think about the JVM, the fundamental unit of I.O. these days, for most of us, I think, is probably still input stream and output stream. But the input stream and output stream are 21 plus years old. Did you know that we have support for asynchronous I.O. in the JVM? We've had it since Java 1.4, which is itself 15 plus years old. So the question is, why don't we just use that? And I think the big, a big reason we don't all use that is because the things above that don't know about it, right? If you imagine, imagine that we, uh, we wrote our code, and obviously most of us don't write our code using input streams and output streams either. We, we write our code using uh, uh, functional, we use our, write our code using primitives with, uh, with uh, computational metaphors that work more naturally uh, with input streams and output streams. So in our code, in our business logic, we don't think about, uh, we, we, we don't think about code in terms of input stream output, and output stream. We think about it in terms of uh, aggregates, aggregates containing domain events or domain types of our business logic. You know, a collection of T, where T is our, our, our customer records or our uh, products or our orders or whatever. Well, this is the way we work, but this work, this mechanism, this style is very different from what we would need to do if we wanted to support this asynchronous approach. So we can't use this uh, for this asynchronous approach. Think about uh, using a collection. Imagine I wanted to move a uh, potentially large amount of data over the wire, huge amount of data, like a terabyte of data. Should I use a collection for that, a Java util collection? Wouldn't that mean I'd have to store everything inside of memory and then dump that uh, you know, all at once to the client? That wouldn't work, would it? I couldn't store all that, I couldn't accumulate all that into memory. What if I have a, a, a something that's gonna be unbounded, like a web socket? I want to send data forever for the next you know, year. Can I use a collection for that? Again, no, right? This computational metaphor doesn't allow us to think about the world with this asynchronous type. So we need something that allows us to think about this new world of asynchronous sort of payloads, potentially unbounded asynchronous payloads. And we need something that, we need a computational metaphor that lets us work like that. Well, a lot of different companies have been trying to do this. A lot of different organizations have been trying to do this. Obviously, uh, Microsoft with the Rx extensions for .NET, that was the first foray into sort of defining these metaphors that inspired uh, the Rx, Rx Java from Netflix. Uh, Akka, you know, the project from Lightbend and uh, used to be called TypeSafe. They have a project that uh, sort of addresses this space as well. At VMware, there were two different projects that were, uh, that are, that were created that are still in use today. There's Reactor, of course, from the Spring team, and there's uh, what was called Node.x, which is now called Vert.x, which is now uh, at the Eclipse Foundation, right? A lot of different companies, a lot of different organizations trying to solve this problem of providing a computational metaphor that lets us work with this new style, this different approach where data, data gets pushed to us as opposed to us pulling it. And there's enough common ground there that uh, a few years ago, all of us got together and defined a de facto specification called the Reactive Stream Specification. The Reactive Stream Specification gives us this primitives, it gives us these primitives that we need to be able to work with this. Is that enough though? Can we write code using that? I'd say no, right? Not, not with that by itself. Imagine that for the last 15 years, uh, Spring and Hibernate and all these other frameworks, struts and you know, web work and whatever, everything we've used in the last 15 years. Imagine, imagine if everything that we've used in the last 15 years just didn't know about collections. It just, they, all, it, they just hated collections. What if Spring and Hibernate just hated collections with a passion? Every time you tried to use a collection, to, to uh, map data in a Hibernate entity or try to use a collection to send a collection back to a, from a REST service in Spring. Imagine every single time you did that, uh, the framework didn't just throw an exception, it actually rendered an ASCII art middle finger and then seg faulted your machine, right? Imagine it did that to you. Would you, would you use collections in your code? And of course not, right? You'd go out of your way to steer clear of those things. You'd make sure you'd never use them lest you fear the wrath of the very angry framework, right? 
Well, this is the situation we find ourselves with reactive streams. If nothing knows or cares about these reactive streams types, then what good are they? It only becomes useful when frameworks that allow us to do our daily work, things like uh, building REST APIs and doing security and data access, when these frameworks uh, support what we're trying to do, only then does this specification become useful. So this is what we're going to talk about today, is we're going to talk about Spring Framework 5, which was released last September in 2017. We're going to talk about Spring uh, Data uh, K, which is the first release train of Spring Data to support reactive data programming. We're going to talk about Spring Security 5, which was released, uh, and it's the first release of Spring Security to support reactive uh, authentication and authorization. And we're going to talk about Spring Boot 2.0, which was just released about a month ago. And we're going to talk about Spring Cloud Finchley, uh, the uh, GA version of which is not yet out, but it's very close, right? We're, we're marching very steadily and very quickly to a GA release. These things all build upon Spring Framework 5, and Spring Framework 5 uh, builds upon Reactor. Reactor is our reactive streams compliant framework. So that's what we're going to talk about today, my friends. We're going to talk about all those things, and we're going to do so by starting here at my second favorite place on the internet, start.spring.io. How many of you know start.spring.io? I'm always curious. OK, so this is my second favorite place on the internet. My first favorite place, of course, is production. I love production. You should love production. Let me see if I've got anything here. Rift delete. Name up. OK. So we're going to go start a program here. This is, a, as I say, start.spring.io, my, my second favorite place on the internet. Uh, my first favorite place is uh, production, of course. You should love production. You should love. You should go to production as often as possible. You should bring the kids, bring the family. The weather is amazing. It's the happiest place on earth. It's the it's the absolute best place on the internet. But if you haven't been to production, then you can begin your journey here at start. That spring. That I owe. If you need inspiration in the early morning before a cup of tea or coffee, start. That spring. That I owe. And if your children are restless and can't sleep, start that spring that I owe. And if you suffer from indigestion after a long night of alcohol abuse and PHP, start that spring that I owe. So we're going to build a new service here today, just the same old kind of thing. I, I love this domain, so I just use it all the time. We're going to build a service called the Reservation Service, which is going to manage entities of type reservation. And in order to do this, we're going to use, uh, well, we can use Java, I guess. Java is fine. Or you can use Kotlin or Groovy. All these are great choices. I'm going to use Java because, you know, why not? Uh, I'm going to use Lombok to make Java just a little bit less tedious and more like Kotlin. So that's a little ironic. Uh, we're going to use uh, React, the Spring Reactive Web Support. We're going to use uh, the Actuator for operational concerns. We're going to use, um, what else do we need? We, uh, we need security, I suspect, reactive spring security. Uh, and then we need some sort of persistence layer, some way of writing our data to the database. And so I could switch to the full version where I so inclined. I can switch there to the full version. And there I'll be given a veritable ocean of checkboxes. And here you see the, the column titled SQL. These are not for us. You see, these options imply JDBC, which is a fundamentally blocking and synchronous operation. These things, however interesting, and while, po and while technically usable, uh, aren't what we want, right? They would require that we do blocking I.O. That, that is to say, we're going to have to sit there and wait for the I.O. to happen. And in order for that to work, we'd have to set up a special thread pool and scale out the thread, uh, scale out the thread pool according to the number of requests we get. We get into the same situation that we don't want to get into in the first place. So let's use something that is natively uh, reactive. We, you know, we should not give up hope. I, I have every confidence that at some point, someday, somewhere, somehow, there will be a SQL uh, option for those of us who want to do reactive programming one day, but, but not now. I'm, I'm heartened. I'm encouraged. I'm uh, enthusiastic about what I saw at Oracle uh, uh, Java 1 in 2016. In 2016, they spent a solid, gee, it must be 10, 20, 20 seconds talking about it, right? So that's promising. And then in then 2017, uh, there, was a, there was a whole one-hour session where they introduced some code that has changed completely since then. So that's kind of promising, too. Uh, one day, one day it'll happen. Not, not today, not tomorrow, maybe not even in our lifetimes, but it will happen. So, so, that's, so that's, that's, that's promising. In the meantime, we need to use a, a NoSQL option, something that is natively, fundamentally reactive. And here we have a number of different options. We have uh, some of which, some options which seem like twins. We have Redis and Reactive Redis. We have MongoDB and Reactive MongoDB. Uh, 
Some don't have a reactive counterpart, and these things are at the moment fundamentally blocking things like Elasticsearch, Solar, etc. So let's limit our choices to the reactive options here. We could use reactive Redis. In fact, I think we will use reactive Redis. Let's go ahead and add that. And while we're at it, use, let's add the Spring Cloud gateway there. Okay. Now we have the um, we have that now. We need uh, some other option, something to model our domain a little bit more readily. We could use uh, Cassandra and uh, Couchbase, both of which are fine choices, but I don't happen to have them installed and running on my local machine. So for now, so for now, it'll, it, it suffices to leave these things uh, as they are. So I think I think that leaves us down to to reactive MongoDB, because when you want to lose your data and you want to lose it reactively, <laughs> there is nothing better than reactive MongoDB. So we'll go ahead and add that. We're going to go ahead and add that. That'll give us all the choices. That'll give us the, the support that we need. Now, I am happy with our selections. I'm happy with our choices. I'm going to go ahead and uh, generate new projects. I do want to spend a brief moment here, just an ever so brief moment, uh, addressing what I consider to be two very serious and, 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 and um, misguiding uh, drop down menus. The first drop down here is the version of Java that we'd like to use. It's 2018, early 2018. So, what version of Java would you like to use? Well, uh, we have given we are given here two choices. The first of which is 8.0, which is the default. And then there's 10. And while 10 is an interesting option, uh, and certainly technically uh, usable, uh, I would not recommend it. Not yet. You see, Java has since moved to a six-month release cadence. That means that every six months, Oracle are going to drop a new version of the JDK, a new version of Java, out into the world. And by default, unless you're on a long-term release, you're going to have to upgrade every six months because support for the previous version stops the day that the new one is released. So if you, drop, if you adopt Java 9, uh, well then six months after Java 9 came out, which is to say eight months ago, uh, six months after it came out, you would have had to move immediately to Java 10. Java 10 will expire in about four or five months. I forget when, September, October, something like that. And as soon as Java 10 comes out, you have to move to Java 11. Java 11 is a long-term release, sort of like the Ubuntu releases and, and so on. So you can park your code at Java 11 and stay there for a few years and still get support. But in the meantime, Java 8 is the only long-term uh, supported release. So I would, were I you, stay with Java 8 until the latest and greatest comes along and you can park your code there. Then we have the choice of packaging. And people get confused by this drop-down menu. They don't understand when and where to choose which. So I'm going to do my level-headed best here now to explain. If by some terrible, terrible, tragic, freak, fluke of physics, some terrible tragedy of time space, some awful accident of space time, you should find yourself somehow transported to the distant, 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 distant past. Then choose dot war. <laughs> but if you're here with me in 2018, then choose dot jar. This is a big part of my overarching and guiding personal philosophy of make jar, not war. <laughs> Again, lots of options. Do as you will. I'm going to leave these choices as they are. Now, we have a new project. I'm going to open this up in my IDE. And any IDE will, just work to, will work just fine. I'm going to use IntelliJ. How many of you are using IntelliJ? I'm always curious. IntelliJ, awesome, good stuff, hot sauce, very nice, well done. Uh, what about Eclipse? I'm just curious. How many of you are using Eclipse? I love Eclipse, good stuff as well. Right on. Uh, what about NetBeans? Anybody using NetBeans? NetBeans, okay, well, that's a great choice as well. Lots of good support there. Emacs, what about Emacs? Are you here, sir? Emacs guy? Where are you? I got rid of him. It doesn't, it seems that no matter which city, no matter which country or which continent I go to, every single time I ask, who uses Emacs? The some guy always raises his hand, I do, I do. It's the same human being. <laughs> it's the same one. It's, it's getting weird. Every single time I say, who uses Emacs? He says, I do, and then he leaves presumably to meet me at the next airport. <laughs> what a troll. Anyway, we have a new application. Let's go ahead and open this application up. I've, uh, is that font too, is that, that's a little, can you see that first of all? Is that too big? It's a little too big. Uh, I will um, make it a little smaller. You see, yesterday, my yesterday, not yours, I was in St. Louis, uh, and then I jumped on a plane and came here, and so I have, the last time I used my computer was on stage. Now, we have a project here. This is a Spring Boot project. It's using all the latest and greatest bits. I'm going to comment out some of the bits that we don't need just yet, like, for example, the Spring security support. Uh, and, um, and I think that's it. For now, I'm happy with those choices. Uh, that said, I do want you to you know, 
take in mind that these are uh, different artifacts than the existing MongoDB artifact, for example, for Spring Data. It says reactive. That's how you can tell. Now, we're going to go ahead and, and uh, build an application that manages entities of type reservation. So we're going to create a document that will be persisted into the database using uh, Spring Data MongoDB. So we're going to create a, uh, two fields here. One is called reservation name and one is called ID. The ID is going to be a uh, primary or document a key, basically, for MongoDB. And we're going to use Lumbach here to make short work of creating all the um, all the uh, getters and setters and two string and all that kind of stuff that you need for your entity. And then I want to be able to write instances of this data into the database. I want to write instances of this record into the database. So I'm going to create a Spring Data repository. Now, this is going to be a, um, a reactive Mongo repository. Uh, this is a pattern from domain driven design. It's a, from, again, another, another mention for Eric Evans there. It's a thing that will handle the tedious, soul annihilatingly boring read, write, update, and delete of instances of data. It's just, it supports CRUD. Uh, and this interface looks, sh it should look very familiar if you've ever used Spring Data, but some things are quite different. If we look at this interface, you can see that it supports all the common CRUD style operations to create, read, update, delete, uh, query, all that kind of stuff. But you notice that here, the insert method takes a publisher. This is that publisher I was telling you about from the Reactive Stream specification. A publisher is a thing that emits items. It publishes items. And a subscriber listens for those items. So the publisher gets a subscriber that subscribes to it. When the subscriber subscribes to the uh, publisher, it is given a subscription first. The subscription is a a link between the producer and the consumer. It is the session between the two types of things. And the subscriber has a most important value uh, or feature. It has a method we can use to specify how much data we are going to get. So think about how this normally works. You have an input stream and you read data from that input stream. You, you've all written this code, I'm sure, a thousand times before, even at university. It's just one of those basic things. While you know, uh, while you're reading data from the input stream, you check that the next byte doesn't equal next, uh, negative one, and then you store that byte or maybe a bunch of bytes in a buffer and you process that. You accumulate the data as fast as you can read through that data, as, th as fast as you can read through that input stream. And that works just fine because you're pulling the data out of the input stream. You're processing it as you go. And so long as uh, you're pulling through that data, you are getting however much data you, you can work with from that input stream and no more. Well, that's the pull style, right? You control the rate of consumption. What about this new push style? Right? We have this publisher. It's going to publish data into your subscriber. Now, whenever a new record is available, your on next method gets called. So now you are being notified asynchronously that there is new data. Well, what happens if the publisher drops, uh, you know, it says, oh, here, hold this, and it gives you a five terabyte chunk of data? What do you do then? It's not going to be good, is it? So we don't want that. We don't want to sit there and be surprised by how much data we get. This risks imperiling the stability of our system. It creates a situation where we can denial of service our own code, our own code base. So instead, we need to be able to stipulate to the publisher, here, I can only handle X records at a time. This basic mechanism is what we have to contend with when we design protocols using you know, low-level uh, networking. Right? If you ever do low-level networking, uh, you have to think about what is called flow control. And that's what this is here. This is flow control. This is our ability to throttle the rate of production from the producer. We are throttling the rate of consumption as well. Flow control in the context of reactive programming is, is called back pressure. So if you've ever heard that term, now you know what it is. It's our ability to push back and say, I can only handle X records at a time. Now, when the subscriber gets that data, the, uh, the, the data arrives here in the on next method. Sometimes there might be an exception, hopefully never, but if it happens, this is what's, what's going to get called. And when the publisher is done processing the data, you get an on complete method. Well, that's it. That's it. These three types are three out of four of the types that you get in the reactive stream specification. There's a fourth type called a processor. A processor is just an interface. It implements both publisher and subscriber. It acts as a bridge, if you will. Uh, it's both a source and a sync for I.O. That's it. If you understand those four types, that's the entire reactive stream specification. And these types are so useful that They've actually been put into Java 9. So if you're using Java 9, they're in Java util concurrent dot flow dot asterisk. Flow is a type, so they're nested interfaces in a top level type. These types are, are everywhere in Spring now, right? So you can see them here in this reactive Mongo repository. We accept a publisher, but you can see that the return values for these methods are a little different. We have types from the, the reactor project, not reactive streams, but the reactor project. Reactor is an API from Pivotal 
from the Pivotal team that supports the Reactive Stream specification. So a Flux is a publisher that produces zero to n values, zero to an unlimited potentially number of values. A Mono is a publisher that produces zero or one value. It's like a future, basically. It has, a, it has the same semantics as a future, but it's asynchronous and it complies with the Reactive Streams publisher type. That's it. Why would you need the distinction? What's the use in that? Well, suppose, you, suppose somebody gives you a publisher and says, here, draw a user interface for that. Are you going to draw a detail page with all the details for that publisher, for that one record? Or are you going to show an overview page with all the records so that you can then click down and see the details? How do you know which one is which? Well, if somebody gives you a, uh, a flux, then it's a detail page. I'm sorry, it's an overview page. If they give you a mono, it's a detail page, right? That kind of thing. Now, these types go beyond the publisher interface as well. They give us operators that we can use to manipulate the streams of data, very much like the Java 8 streams API. So that's why it's useful to, to work in terms of these, these specific subtypes. So we see that this interface now makes a lot of sense. We have publishers as inputs, and we have very specific subtypes here for the outputs, right? Now, I have an interface, Spring Boot will, uh, sorry, Spring Data using, you know, well, Spring Boot will use Spring Data to create an imp implementation of this interface, and we can use that to write data to the database. So let's do that. We're going to write data in an application runner here. This is a callback interface that Spring Boot will observe on our object, and it's going to use it to write data to the database for us. So I'm going to say reservation repository, and I'm going to inject a pointer to this repository into my application runner. So I want to write data to the database here. Let's create some data using uh, the Reactive Streams Flux type. So my name is Josh. It's so nice to meet you all. Uh, miss, what's your name? How do you spell that, my friend? I-E-A? T-A, I'm sorry, like that? N-Y-A. Like that? Very cool. Nice to meet you, buddy. Thank you so much for that. Uh, let's see. Uh, da -da 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 -da. 15, no, no, no. Uh, what about you, buddy? What's your name? How do you spell that? A-Y-A-Y-U-S-H? Okay, sorry, A-Y. Like this. Very good, nice to meet you, buddy. Thank you so much for that. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Miss, what's your name? Hi, yeah. Hi, wh whoops, sorry, what? T H E J A N like this. Very cool. Nice to meet you. All right, there's four of us. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to visit each record in this uh, in this publisher. I'm going to change each name into a new reservation. So I'll say new reservation, passing a null for the ID and passing in the name there. Uh, and then what I want to do is I want to map each one of those uh, into a thing that's going to be saved into the database. So I'm going to say R. And I'll say this dot reservation repository dot save R E. Right? So there's this. Okay, there's the uh, saved data. Whoops. So there's the saved data. And what I have here, you can see, is a publisher of publishers. That's not what I want. So what happens is each one of these map calls. Un it gives us the return value and it wraps it in publisher. So this gives us a publisher of publishers because we have a a mono that gets returned here. So what I actually have to do is say flat map. And that unpacks the intermediate publisher there. So this is all the saved data. Now, if I leave this code as is and run it, what do you think is going to happen? Well, nothing. Exactly. You see, this code, quite like myself, is lazy. It needs to be uh, encouraged to do work. In order to do that work, you say save.subscribe. And here, you have to give it a publisher, or you can use one of the overloaded subscribe calls from the reactor project. So that'll work. That'll, that'll work you know, as we'd hope it would. But again, we have another problem here. You see, there's an expression in English, uh, a broken clock strikes true twice a day. Or, e or better yet, even a broken clock strikes true twice a day. It means that by virtue of the fact that the hands on a broken clock are fixed, they're stuck, right? They're, maybe they're at this 3 o'clock or whatever, you know. They're at some fixed point in time. And the result of this is that even though it's broken, in the AM and in the PM, that clock will be correct twice a day, right? And the same is true for MongoDB. Every now and then, it will save some data. Not a lot. Not a lot. But every now and then. And so I want to make sure that we don't have any duplicate data when I run this program. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say this.reservationpositor.deleteAll, and then that's going to give me a mono. 
So I could say, okay, well, I need to subscribe, right? Well, again, here's another problem with this code. I've got the subscribe callback, but that's asynchronous. When I use that, I, there's no guarantee that this line will execute before this line. None whatsoever. So I need to force this line to finish before. I could say block, but that's a terrible way to do this. Here I have this nice reactive API and I'm blocking on purpose. What's the point? So instead, what I want to do is use these nice operators from the reactive stream specification, or from a reactor in particular. So I'm going to say, I'm going to do the deletion first, then I'm going to do all this, then I'm going to get all the data from the repository, and then finally, I'll subscribe to the final thing. So what I have here is multiple stages. I've got this stage, this stage, this stage, and then finally I'm subscribing. These operators let me write code that looks deterministic. I'm writing this line first, and then this line, and then this one, and then this one. It's working exactly as I think. But behind the scenes, this is fundamentally asynchronous. There's no reason that this line uh, would otherwise have to be on, uh, you know, before this line, unless I use these operators. These operators make something that is fundamentally asynchronous and potentially concurrent look simple. Now keep in mind, it is asynchronous and concurrent, uh, potentially. So I, I can control the so scheduler that's used to uh, decide where to run this thing. I can actually provide a new scheduler if I want. Uh, you know, new single, whatever. Okay? I can control that if I want to. Most of the time you don't need to. Most of the time you get a thread pool that has as many threads as you have uh, uh, cores on your machine. You get event loops for every single core, basically. And that's the right default. But again, it's just interesting to know that. We didn't have to use a cyclic barrier. There's no, there's no phasers, no semaphores, no threads, no uh, countdown ba barriers, no cyclic, uh, cyclic barriers or countdown latches. There's none of that here. It just works. Okay? So we have a fundamentally very complicated piece of code that looks very simple. Now, we have uh, some data in the database. Let's see what happens if we run this. All right, look at that. There we are. We happy few. It worked. Of course it worked. It was a demo. <laughs> what were you expecting? Instead, what I want to talk to you about is this. This is the ASCII artwork in Spring Boot. This artwork took a long time to get right, but you see, we on the Spring team have many people who are doctors, PhDs, people who in their previous lives worked in nuclear physics, star stuff. The very celestial bodies in the heavens above us were their daily bread and butter. So it makes me happy to imagine that someday, somewhere, somehow, there was a GitHub issue. A GitHub issue that said, darn it, we need to go to ASCII artwork. And I think you can agree they did a great job. So it's for this reason that I want to take a brief moment, just an ever so brief moment, to talk about what I consider to be a very serious and glaring deficiency in the IntelliJ, IntelliJ JetBrains product. For while I'm a fan, I consider this to be particularly short-sighted. Do you see that checkbox? It says, hide banner. <laughs> what the hell? That's a dumb feature. I'm not even sure why it's there, IntelliJ. So I did what all people would do in that same situation. And again, I'm not a hero. You don't have to thank me. I was just doing what anybody would do. I went on the internet and I complained loudly. And I sent out a message of pain. And I got a message of hope from my friend Jan Sebron. This is Jan. Hi. He's a software developer by passion at IntelliJ Idea JetBrains. And he responded with this message of hope, which I share with you here today now. He keeps, in, he keeps saying it's going to be in the next release. Now, of course, this was 2016, so I don't, I don't know what that means. But he keeps saying it's going to be there, and I, 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 I'm very hopeful. That said, sometimes people ask me, can they change the ASCII artwork? Can I override the ASCII artwork? That's a ridiculous question. Why would you want to do that? But even, if, even so, I'll show you how. All you have to do is copy a banner.txt file like this. Desktop misc banner.txt to the downloads reservation service source main resources. File, okay. Sort of reservation service, Maven clean spring hyphen boot colon run. And uh, wait, zero. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, run. <laughs> now, I love this, but there's a few things you should pay attention to here first. Meow. 
And then second of all, <laughs> now that said, this is not by any stretch the, uh, the only thing we can do here. Uh, in Spring Boot 2.0, which is after all part of what we're talking about here, we released the latest and greatest feature, arguably the best, biggest feature to ever be released into any software ever in the history of all things. So I'm going to show you that now. <laughs> here we are. Maven clean spring hyphen boot colon run. Oh yeah. <laughs> now, it is not lost to me, it is not lost on me that of all the things that are, are not reactive and asynchronous in this, uh, our banners are not. So yeah, sure, it adds like 30 seconds to the startup time. I don't even care. Totally worth it. Totally worth it totally worth it. Okay, anyway, we've got data in the database, now we need to build a REST API. And here we could use Spring MVC style res, you know, REST controllers like this, right? Reservation REST controller, private final reservation uh, repository, and uh, we'll add a constructor argument here, and we'll create an endpoint, forward slash reservations, and it's just going to be a publisher of reservation, like so. Okay, return this dot reservation repository at find all. There we are. And when you start up the application, like this, localhost 8080 forward slash reservations. Mm -hmm. So here we are. We've got the data. We've got all the records back. That worked. That's that that's fine. Now, but keep in mind, this is still a reactive publisher, right? This is a reactive app uh, re rest endpoint. And the data is that's coming back here uh, is is gonna be potentially unbounded, right? This is, we've only got eight records here, but it could be a billion records. It could be a trillion records. We could, we could emit new records as long as there's heat in the universe, right? This is not the same thing as before. This is not a collection. This is a publisher. And so Spring has to treat it a little differently. We can't sit there and accumulate all the data into memory and then turn that into JSON at the end of the document, at the end of the production of that data, for example. The bytes that come out of this publisher, we have to take it and stream it back to the client and turn it into JSON or XML or whatever, one record at a time. Fundamentally, everything, things are very different in the spring, uh, in this spring world. We are using Spring MVC style endpoints, but this is not Spring MVC. This is Spring WebFlux, and this is not a servlet ap application. This is a Netty-based application. There's no servlet API in this code at all. There's no blocking API in this code at all. Everything is, by default, asynchronous. And so you can see that here in action, right? I can, instead of doing something very different, uh, you know, to, to do asynchronous things like you would have to do uh, with, um, with uh, Spring MVC, we can do the same old thing and get the same, and get, and get asynchronous results. So like, like, we can do this, for example, we can do uh, service end events. Return flux dot generate sync, sync dot next, hello world at instant dot now dot to string and then uh, we can turn that whole thing into a thing that gets delayed so dot delay elements duration of seconds one so now I've got a fundamentally uh, asynchronous thing that's being generated every second I'm generating new data every second and I can restart the application and hit SSE okay curl Right? So again, now I'm doing service and events. That's going to produce new data every second for the rest of time. As long as there's heat in the universe, that'll keep producing new, new records. Every second, though, it's going to produce new data. In between the, that second, uh, you know, in, in between each interval, that thread is freed up. We can do something else with it. Right? Okay, so now we've got data in the database. We've got uh, a REST endpoint. I like this Spring ABC style endpoint, but it is by no means the only way you can do REST endpoints these days. You can also do functional reactive endpoints, like so. At bean, uh, Fun um, router function, server response, router return, router functions, dot re route, request predicates, dot git, forward slash reservations. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to return a functional reactive endpoint. So this is a separate style, and uh, you can mix and match this with existing Spring MVC style endpoints. But the result is that we're writing code uh, based on this predicate and handler model. So I'm going to say rr.findall, 
and then I'm going to tell the runtime that I'm sending back payloads of type reservation. Now, if I restart this endpoint, if I restart the code, let me uh, put that back down here. If I restart this, replace it, restart this, clean it up, and this. All right, and this, and finally this one. There's my entire API. There's my entire REST endpoint. You see? One line. It's a REST endpoint. And the way it's working is I'm saying I've got this HTTP request predicate, right? This thing here. And this is chainable. I can say and, and I can provide my own new request predicate. And I can just say, oh, you know, if math.random is greater than 0.5, then, then match this request. I can do whatever I want here, whereas with Spring MVC style uh, regular endpoints, I would have to work within the confines of this annotation. If it supports what we want to do, great. But if it doesn't, then you have to do an end run normally around that annotation. In functional reactive endpoints, you have a full programmatic interface here. Similarly, this handler method here is very, very, very easy to like, you know, write as lambdas. So this is very nice. You have one place to look at all the routes in the application as well. Whereas with Spring MVC, uh, all the applications, all the mapping is in different places. So we re restart this application. Yeah. We can see it here. And reservations. Okay, very good. Now, this is up, up and running. Uh, that's a simple thing. I do want to spend now in just a few minutes, we want, I, do, I do want to spend just a few minutes to look at one last, uh, a couple last uh, opportunities here for reactive programming. I showed you uh, basics for Spring Boot and Spring Data and, and so on, but the real benefit of this is not just in these particular frameworks, it's where it extends to from here. So we have a new project in Spring Cloud called Spring Cloud Gateway. And Spring Cloud Gateway, uh, is useful for all sorts of API gateway style things. So I can say, here's a route locator builder, RLB, and I'm going to say RLB dot uh, routes dot route, and I'm going to say R, uh, and I'm going to create a, um, a predicate that says when somebody calls this node and hits the forward slash proxy endpoint, then I'm going to set the filter, uh, I'm going to set the filter to set the uh, target path to guides, and I'll forward the whole thing, I'm going to proxy the whole thing to HTTP Spring I.O. like that, okay? And then dot build. Oops. Okay. And then that, and then dot build. All right, so I'm creating an API gateway here. Very, very simple example, but you can do other things like rate limiting and rewriting ports and paths and headers and statuses and, and so on. So now, proxy, uh, did I, what did I do wrong here? I have two of them. I should have named this one Gateway. Gateway. Okay. Very good. So there's the, the proxy page, right, from Spring Out Guides. That's one opportunity for reactive programming. And the other is uh, when you think about eventing and messaging and event driven architectures, you think about this new world where we have a potentially unbounded amount of data. Uh, and as data moves in, we want to be able to process it. So uh, a common there's a, there's a lot of workloads, a lot of workloads out there that are best described as what, we, what I would think of as back office. They're work that happens in the background. You have a queue that sits in front of it. Uh, and um, uh, that queue uh, is a, is a uh, it stages the messages and then sends the message to your functionality. Again, these are the kinds of things that you would think of as being event-driven architectures, right? How many of you are doing serverless programming or AWS Lambda or something like that? Okay, well, this is an opportunity for you. There's a lot of really, really powerful things you can do here. Now, all I'm going to do is I'm going to use Spring Cloud Function quickly here, Project Riff. Uh, and Spring Cloud Function is a, uh, is a way to write serverless or function as a service based code. You can use it with AWS Lambda or Azure or Google or whatever, or, and Project Riff, which is our new open source Kubernetes based function as a service platform. And so now, if I go to the downloads directory, UAO, uppercase, open this up, I'm going to add this, I'm going to create a Spring Cloud Function application. I'm going to deploy this to my Project Riff installation running on my local machine. I, uh, I'm going to add Spring Cloud Starter Function Web Org Spring Framework Cloud. All right, so now I've got that on the class path, and now I can write some code that uses this API, the Spring F Cloud Function API, to write a very simple function. I'll say function of publisher of string input and a publisher of string output. I'm just going to take a, the string that comes in, I'm going to uppercase it. So in, in dot map x, x.2 uppercase, 
There we are. So very, very simple function. But imagine anything that takes any kind of time at all, maybe send an email, maybe generate a report, any of that kind of stuff that would live in the back office. That's an ideal use case for this kind of function as a service runtime. So now I'm going to maven clean package this. And I have riff running in the background here. So I'm going to do eval uh, mini cube docker env. Okay, I'm going to do maven, I'm going to do riff create java artifact is the target, that's the uh, uppercase here. The uh, input name, the input Kafka topic is going to be called up. The name of the function is going to be called up. And the handler is going to be called um, uppercase uppercase and the main class is com example uppercase uppercase application like so and that'll create a docker a docker file and uh, some kubernetes resources and now i can see riff list there's my different function now i'm going to publish some data to that function that's running in the background now if there are no instances of this thing running then it'll start up an instance of the container uh, and it'll respond if there are Multiple, if there's an existing one, it'll use that. So I'm going to say, send it to the up queue, the Kafka queue, send this payload called Hello Vox Singapore, and then generate a response. So here we go. Knock on wood. First time it has to start up cold. There we go. All right, my friends. We have just looked at a number of different ways to apply reactive programming to our applications. Hopefully you saw something here uh, that you care about or you want to see or want to be able to use more. Uh, we are just beginning to touch, to scratch the surface here. I wish we had more time. If we had more time, uh, well, we, we, we do have more time. Come to my workshop tomorrow. That'll be okay. Uh, if we had more time, we could have covered microservices and building distributed systems with all this kind of stuff, uh, going beyond just this basics that we've looked at here. I want to thank you so much for your time today. Did you see anything you liked in this at all today? Just curious. Did you see anything that you, that you could use? Five people, 10 people? Well, I'll take it. Very good. Thank you so much, everybody. Cheers.